This is my song, Bella Bye. It's got an interesting little finger picking technique and uh, you'll learn which technique it is in a sense. Uh, the only prerequisite would be being able to play with your fingers. And just quickly, if you've never played with your fingers before, your thumb usually takes care of the sixth string, the fifth string, and the fourth string. Then your first finger takes care of the third, your second takes care of the second string, and your third does the second. So you could even just practice something like this, just to get the feel of what it feels like to pluck those strings with your fingers, basically. Now, classical players will have entire books with miles and miles of finger picking exercises. But for me, when I wanted to learn how to finger pick, my first teacher, Lou Sabini, just said, get uh, the Aaron Shearing classical guitar method book, the first one, and um, just play a few pages in there. And it taught you the IMA, classical numbering or lettering, I guess, of those fingers. And it just showed you how to do a few different patterns. So with that, and then Paul Simon and the Beatles and uh, some Lindsey Buckingham, I was just on my way. I jumped into songs. I didn't learn patterns. On the chats, I guess there are a lot of students who are asking me, give me a new finger picking pattern. Give me a new um, exercise. I understand wanting to streamline and say, just try this or just uh, learn this technique because they want to add something to their right hand or their finger picking hand repertoire. But for me, I never thought of it in terms of give me another exercise or give me another uh, technique. I just heard it in a song. I heard it already applied. I heard how cool it sounded. If Paul Simon was doing something different that I knew I didn't play yet, I wanted to learn that song to, to nick that exercise, to nick that technique. So I did that with James Taylor. I did it with Paul Simon. I did it with some, uh, Lindsay Buckingham and just songs that I wanted to learn. So even if it was built into a Stevie Wonder tune somewhere or someplace, if I heard something interesting, I went and grabbed what strings were changing around. Really, what you're doing here are making different arpeggios of different notes. Because as you finger the chords on this side, you're getting different notes and string combinations. So this one is very, very simple. And this is one that Paul McCartney does on a couple of his tunes, solo and in the Beatles. And you just play the outer shapes. So the outer strings of those shapes, even though on this sheet you'll see on Bella Bye it's calling it a C chord, I'm not playing a big strumming C chord, I'm just playing these notes. So I'm playing my first finger on C, my third finger on E. And it's a shape that you've seen in a Beatle tune before. And so with the picking hand, I'm using my thumb and my second finger. As I move that to the D, I just move that whole picture up to the fifth fret. Now what's interesting, and I think you'll find that, uh, you'll hear this, uh, since Paul had often recorded and written songs down a whole step, this is whole, written and also down a whole step on the recording. But I'll teach it to you here. And um, then we'll play with the recording. The second one is just the first finger on the fifth string and the third finger on the D. That's pretty much where we're gonna stay with those kinds of shapes. They're called voicings and tenths. Then here's this G. Just the low G with the B. could use the B open, or I think I have just the G open here. And you notice I'm tuning those strings. You'll find every time you play down here in these open positions, your octaves are the first thing that give you away when you're out of tune. So even though you tune to a tuner, you've probably heard lots of teachers here on the jam play session say, just because you tune each open string to a tuner doesn't mean you're in tune. You need to set your intonation to be in tune so that these little open chords and things will actually be in tune. And setting your intonation is covered in a lot of other lessons. So look into that. But also, once you've tuned 
and you're into intonation is set, and you go to play a chord, check your octaves. And just make sure they're in tune, so then your open chords will sound great. So I played low G, the middle G on the third string, and the top G. Then I played this low A, the A on the G string, and the A on the top string. And I've also checked the open D with that fretted D. And then you're ready to rock. So the finger picking technique that happens then is that it's usually the fifth string and the second string alternating with this open G. And these shapes are really fun to move around. They sound like you're doing something, again, that is a little bit different and more interesting than just strumming. That would have impressed me to write this tune. What I was after were these shapes. I wanted to nick these shapes and write my own tune. So that repeats a few times. So I'm playing just those notes that are fretted with the open string. And then if there's any strumming that happens afterwards, it's just your first finger gently playing somewhere between the fourth, third, and the second string. It's not anything that fancy. Paul Lowy says, I don't really know how to finger pick proper. George and John knew how to finger pick proper. I just sort of... And to get that sound, that's what you've got to do. So the middle section... What I liked about it was I just moved shapes around to find what I wanted to play. I played with the shapes that you know from other beatle tunes, and I just tried to find my own progression with it. And came up with a progression that I liked and then wrote my own melody and words to it. So it's actually implying chords that we really know. When I play up to this seventh fret here, that's an E minor, but it's definitely different than E minors that we learn as full chords. And that's what I liked about it, it was the big open sound. So now we've got a G over an F. The harmony implied is what's happening. It's a G sound with the low F note. Back to the E minor. And that part just thrilled me. When I went back and learned after the shapes, what am I actually playing? What chord sounds is that? It's an E flat diminished chord. By just taking this shape, playing the E flat, hitting that high A on top in the fifth position, um, you might look at this sheet when you go for the supplemental and say, well, which number is where? Usually, when you say, put this in the fifth position, put this in the fifth fret, it's one fret before your second finger. Because we stretch so much with the first finger this way and we could stretch this way, you might think, well, well am I in the fourth fret? Am I in the fifth fret? Which number? Am I really in the sixth fret? It's whatever fret is before your second finger. That's how you know what position you're in. And guitarists go back and forth with saying position or fret as meaning the same thing, you know, like which place should you be in. So the line for that section to the E minor, to the G over F, to the E minor, to the E flat diminished, E flat augmented, just playing again with that shape and these outer notes. Now we've got a B flat six in the sixth position by just playing the B flat in this G. G diminished in the fourth position there with the first finger in the high B flat. This might sound a little like, oh no, this sounds too complicated, but it really isn't. If you look at the shapes, they're not complicated at all. And you don't have to know the names of these things. What you're trying to experience is these shapes to play these interesting voicings. And then of course, learn the Beatle tune that does these kind of voicings and get this little finger-picking thing together. It's a really good tune to learn for finger-picking because it's really not that difficult. Like I said, it's just these outer notes and the... You know, and... If you think...
think it's a tune that's too challenging because I know a couple of people in the chat have asked me to teach them this tune. And I might be going too fast in this video, I'm not sure. I'm not trying to leave any of you out. And But the thing is, if you try to play a tune like this that takes your playing up to a new level, you'll actually get better with that. So it's a good tune, even if you're learning it one shape at a time, one chord at a time, one fingering picking, trying to get used to where your fingers should go on which strings at a time. You build on that with each repetition of learning the tune. So it's really good for you. Now I'm on the C major seven to the C. little toggling thing that just makes it sound cool in the middle of the tune. Back to the G. Oh, I'm in playing that G7 I said I don't use. Pretty cool. Sounds good there in context. Back to the G. So then there's another way to fingering the G here for the bridge. A really nice way to play the G minor. A minor. They even show you that on you know easy chord charts to say yeah you can get away with playing an easy A minor that way. But now we go to A flat by doing with no open strings. That D would sound bad as it just did. Here's A flat and the C natural. So what I like to do usually when I'm playing it is have the first finger mute the fifth and the sixth strings. You'll notice on the little chart there for the A flat. Everything is X'd out except for these two notes, these two strings. It's hard to... I'm hearing it anyway, but... You could even just strum the two outer strings. And if they're muted enough, you can strum it and you won't hear it. You'll just hear the percussiveness of those strings. Back to the G. And so those are the shapes for Bellabai. play along to the recording that we'll do in a few minutes, it'll be down a whole step. So you just have to tune all the way down. And um, the cool thing about listening to it is it will be the actual record. Now, if you're interested in recording, what was really fun about that was I had one mic, one condenser mic pointing at the 12th fret, another one up over my shoulder pointing down at the body of the acoustic guitar, and another condenser mic out here to sing into and the three of them really were picking up the vocal as well as the guitar and the space the air between this mic and this mic was so delicious it was such a nice sound that it really sounds nice in the headphones so it's a really good little spatial recording that way because we get so used to recording things direct and so many things close mic that there isn't enough air on the recordings so that's a nice way to record an, an acoustic guitar. There's so many, you can just Google acoustic guitar techniques for miking and, and get some really great ideas. What would be really cool um, now is to just play along with the track. Mm -hmm. 